in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Scripture says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23 and 24 says this, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's pray. Father, as we come to you this morning, I just pray, Lord, that your word will go forward and, Lord, be clear, to be understandable. Lord, that it will be able to apply to whatever situations <clears throat> that we find ourselves at. We also pray, Lord God, that whatever we've brought into the, your house this morning, whatever needs that we've brought here, Lord, that, Lord, we can leave them at your feet. We can drop them at your feet. And, Lord, we know that, in, that the answer that we will always find is you for whatever need that we have, for whatever we're facing in life. I pray that, Lord, your words will be spoken this morning, not my words, and that all that are here, let them hear what the Spirit has to say to our church this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> There's a, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, <clears throat> Scripture says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? There was a lot of argument. There's a great offense towards the cross of Jesus Christ. There were the Jews and the Greeks took great offense to the message of the gospel that was being preached when Jesus came. For the Jews, their problems was this. It minimized their works that they were performing. They took great, or they were very stringent in observing the Levitical law, observing the law of Moses. And they were really bound, tied, tight to the law. And here comes Jesus, and Jesus is saying that, for by, or Apostle Paul says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the Jewish people took pride in all their works. Like I said, they were very stringent. And then here comes Apostle Paul preaching it. Before the Apostle Paul, here was Jesus and his disciples telling everyone that it, through the law, the law profits you nothing. It is of grace or it is of nothing. It is of faith or it is of nothing. Either you have your complete, total trust, hope, faith in what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, or it means nothing. It doesn't matter how much work you do. It doesn't matter how wonderful your life is, you think. It doesn't matter how many commandments that you keep. If, you're not, if your faith is not in Jesus Christ and what He's done on the cross, None of this matters. And the Jews took great offense to this. They couldn't believe that someone could so easily just lay aside the law of Moses. And their problem was they didn't understand that the law was always intended to be a preparation for the grace that was to come. The law was, the total purpose of the law was so that grace might abound. So the Jews had great problems accepting the message of the cross. They had great problems accepting the gospel message. Now the Greeks had other problems. you got to understand the Greeks were very proud people. They were intelligent people. They walked around with great pride and arrogance because they were super smart people. And they looked at this Jesus that the Apostle Paul was preaching, and some of them remember looking at this Jesus, this criminal, hanging between, between two thieves, and we're supposed to worship 
Him? We're supposed to put our trust in Him? And at the cross, they cried out, He saved others, Himself He cannot even save. He saved others, Himself He cannot save. And they mocked Jesus at the cross. If you be God, come down off that cross. So the Greeks were the very intelligent, the very smart. See, I can't use those intelligent words because I'm not smart enough to figure out the words they would use, but they were the Oxford's finest. And they couldn't understand that it was through death that he would save them. They saw Jesus hanging on a tree. They saw him with nails pierced through both of his hands and through his feet with a crown of thorns and blood coming down. They saw that as the ultimate defeat. As one that is just a criminal, one that has nothing to give. But they didn't understand the beautiful plan, the beautiful purpose of God in sending Jesus Christ to the cross. They saw it only as a defeat. They couldn't understand that through the cross of Jesus Christ, grace would then abound to all people. We talked a couple Sundays ago about grace abounding and how grace has abounded, how it is broadened out and it's to reach all people in all, all spectrums. <clears throat> They were men of such high degree, Oxford's finest. They were standing there witnessing this criminal hanging between two, three, two thieves and to think that such an undignified sight, it was absurd. And you want us to put our faith and our hope in that? You want us to put our trust in that? And it goes on, and it's going on, and it goes on, and we continue to this very day. And mankind looks, and mankind says, you want us to put our hope, you want us to put our trust in that? And the businessman says, no, I'll put my trust in my wealth. I'll put my trust in my finances. I'll put my trust in my bank account. I'm not going to trust God for my provision. I'm not going to trust God to take care of my family. I'm not going to trust God to take care of my business. <clears throat> and so the worldly man, the worldly businessman, there are godly businessmen, but the worldly businessman says, my hope, my faith, my trust is in the ultimate dollar bill. I don't trust that to take care of me and my family. And so just as the Greeks and just as the Jews, we sit back and we look at this Jesus hanging on a tree. We look at this Jesus who's got blood stains pouring down his face and a crown of thorns pressed on him and nails in his hands and his feet. And we look at that and we say, you want me to trust my future in that? The great actors, the Oscars, I, don't, I never watched any of it, but you know they roll out the red carpet at the Oscars and Hollywood's elitist and Hollywood's finest <clears throat> wears the gowns and the tuxedos and they walk down the red carpet and they look at Jesus hanging on the cross and they say, you want me to put my faith, my trust in that? No. I'll trust my faith and my, and my future in my fortune and in my fame. I'm not putting my faith and my trust in some uh, horrible looking sight of that. And the Hollywood's elitist and finest, and they walk with their tuxedos, and they walk with their chest held out, and full of pride for their fame and for all the fortune 
and for all the recognition and just how famous they are around the world and how everybody wants to be like them. And they say, and you want me to give up all of this? You want me not to trust in all of this? No, I think I would rather trust in my fame. I think I would rather trust in my name. I think I'd rather trust that Hollywood's going to take care of me. <clears throat> I'm not putting my trust in that sight there hanging on that tree. That's just, boy, that's a terrible looking sight. And so the reasons they, like I said, they go on down through history why people won't surrender their lives to Christ. You know, you don't have to be a person at the Oscars. You don't have to be Donald Trump. You don't have to be somebody super rich. You don't have to be Warren Buffett. You don't have to be a Bloomberg. You can be Common Joe out there, and you can be somebody that says, I just don't know that I can trust in this Jesus. I don't know that I can really put my hope and my faith in this Jesus. I think maybe, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really worried about this job that I have because that's my hope. That, that's, without this job, I don't know what I'm going to do in life. And the individual laying there that's sick, and they're saying, I don't know what I'm going to do if the doctors can't help me. I don't know what I'm going to do if the hospital can't figure out what's wrong with me. And yet, you're telling me you're, I'm supposed to trust in that? That man hanging there on a tree? That criminal hanging between two thieves? And I'm supposed to... I'm supposed to not trust in the doctors. I'm supposed to not trust in the medications. I'm not supposed to trust in the hospitals. I'm supposed to trust in that? It goes through every situation. It filtrates through every individual, through everything in life. And we have people that will not even give their life or their hearts to Jesus Christ but then we go on the flip side, and we have those that are Christians. And we have those that have come to the cross of Jesus Christ, and they've given their lives and their hearts to Jesus Christ. And that's really this particular passage of Scripture. The Paul, Paul is saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And there are those Christians that come to Jesus Christ and they say, yeah, I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I've given my heart to Jesus Christ. But then they left it there. And they never moved forward. They never went any farther with the Lord. And Jesus says, see the whole particular point about that passage is this. There's more to Jesus than just an escape, a fire escape. There's more to Jesus than a ticket to heaven. Jesus wants to meet every single need that you have. Jesus wants to be everything that he needs to be for you and I. And there are those that believe in justification. We believe that a person is justified through faith. We believe that if our faith is in Jesus Christ and what He's done on Calvary, then we know that we're saved. But then we never go any farther with the Lord. So there's those that refuse to give up anything to the Lord. And then there's the other side where there are the Christians that have accepted Him as Lord and Savior. They've made Him Lord of their life. But then that's where they've stopped. Let me give you a good illustration of this. In Joshua 18, verse 1 through 3, let me read this to you. This is an example from the Old Testament. It says, The whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh. 
And they set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are you slack to go to possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? <clears throat> In other words, how long are you just going to sit here and do nothing? How long are you going to sit here and not move into the glorious life that I have for you? See, what happened, much like the people of today, the Christians of today, there were seven tribes that the tabernacle was erected and they all camped around that tabernacle, these seven tribes, and the Lord had said, go out and possess the land. Go out and take claim to your inheritance. But these seven tribes, they just sat around the tabernacle, camped out, feeling all at ease, not, not doing anything to try to, to move in and grab their inheritance. And they sat camped around this, the tabernacle. Much like the believers of today, we are situated in church, we sit around the presence of other believers, and we sit in the presence of the Lord, and we come to the house of God, and we never go any farther. We get born again, we get saved, and that's it. We never move into any other realm of spirituality. We never go any farther with the Lord than just a, the process of we're, we're saved, now we're done. We've been justified, now we're done. Let me say something to you. Justification is not the end. Salvation is not the end of your experience with God. Justification or salvation is intended to produce sanctification. See, God saved you not as just so that He could some way or another keep you from going to hell. God saved you that He could create in you the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. It's one thing to break down the walls of Jericho it's another thing to go in and take possession of the city. There's a lot of areas in our lives that the walls have been broke down, but God has still not taken possession of every area of our life. He wants us to go in and take captivity, those things which still hold us bondage. He wants us to go in and take captivity to those things that we're still battling the devil with. I looked on Facebook, my Juanita texted me this, and I saw this on Facebook, I don't need to give a name or nothing, because I don't want to embarrass anybody, our sermons are put on Facebook now, so I don't want to embarrass anybody, but it, it bothers me when I see Christians that I put on Facebook, and under the caption is talking about how they're going to go out and have a good time, they're going to party tonight and going to get drunk. And they close it out with an explicit, whatever that word, I don't, even, I don't use bad language, so they closed it out with the F-bomb. That's all I know. And I thought, what is going on with Christians today? What is happening to believers today? that they can think that, and I know for a fact that they go to church, and they think that it's okay to live a lifestyle like that. It's okay to have such a contradiction in their life like that. God says, tear down the walls of Jericho, but don't, after you tear down the walls, don't walk away. Go in and take possession. He says, go ahead and camp around my presence. Go ahead and come into my presence but then go out and take possession of the land. Don't just sit around laying slack. Don't sit around not getting anything accomplished, not doing anything with it in your Christian walk. Take possession. I've got to work for you. Now there's two things I want to hit here. Of course, we're to take possession. God has a work, has a purpose, has a plan for us. 
we got a lot of wonderful things that we are working on, the board and I, in the future of our church. We're going to be doing a lot more this coming spring. We're going to hit off, and we're going to really begin doing a lot of advertising, a lot of witnessing, a lot of going out and trying to reach our community and let, our, let them know that our church is here. That's one thing. Go out and possess the land. There are lost souls out there that God wants to reach, but he can't reach them unless you're willing to be his feet and his hands and his mouth. But then there's another error where even in your own walk, in your own life, God wants to take possession of those strongholds. We've been talking about it in Sunday school where Satan has these strongholds in your life and God wants to come in and take possession of those strongholds and he wants to free you from sin that you've been bound to. He wants to set you free from thoughts that you've been thinking that have been ungodly. He wants to set you free from words that have been coming out of your mouth that should have never came out of your mouth. Those are strongholds in your life. He wants you to go in and take possession of your body, take possession of who you are. He wants you to take possession of the kingdom of God and allow Him to rule and reign in that and tear all those strongholds down. Again, like I said, there is so much more to the believer than just salvation. There's so much more to just being getting saved there's another realm for the believer, and that's called sanctification. And in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what Paul St. Paul is laying out the argument against is this. For them that believe that a person can be justified and not be sanctified. His, his argument is this. He addresses this argument that people are saying... I can be justified, but I don't have to be concerned about sanctification. I can be right with God, I can be saved, but it doesn't matter about the rest of my life. I can still live like I want to live. I can still do all the things that I want to do. I don't, it, it doesn't matter to me. I don't have to worry about that. If I want to go out and have a good time, I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a good time. If I want to go out and I'm going to party with the, the rowdy, I'm going to go out and I'm going to party with the rowdy. It doesn't matter. And, and the Apostle Paul begins to deal with this process. Their argument is saying, well, you're trying to tell me that, um, uh, that if I accept this Jesus Christ, then that's, and, and there's no works to anything, then that means I can just go out and do whatever I want to do. And the Apostle Paul's making the argument, saying, absolutely not, God forbid. He says, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is, when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there comes a change that begins to take place in you. And if you allow Him to come in and take possession of you, He will mold you and make you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. God the Father will. And I, You know, we've all heard these arguments. Every single one of us heard these arguments. And this is the arguments that come from people that have a life without holiness. They say, now that I'm saved, I can do anything I want to do. There's no need for me to be concerned about any sinful habits if I want to take a drink of alcohol or take a drink of alcohol. No need for me to worry about the language, the words that come out of my mouth. You know, don't... I'll, I'll keep using the same language I'm still using because you know what? Um, I'm not, we're not going to get into all this legalism stuff, they say. I was told this one time, and I, I led a Bible study. They didn't have me very long. i got to be careful, because like I said, people listen to my sermons. Um, in this particular Bible study, the, they were making arguments about a lot of churches so steeped in legalism, and they say you can't do this, and they say you can't do that, and they say you can't do this, and and you've got to give up that, and you've got to give, quit that. And, and they went on and on and on. And I finally raised my hand, and I said this. I said, I think that what we're doing here is we're confusing two issues. We're confusing legalism with holiness. I said, there is a difference. Legalism deals with trying to keep the Old Testament law, the, um, trying to keep all of the rituals and the ordinances of the Old Testament law trying to be saved and made right with God through that way. But I said, holiness is creating us into the image to be like His Son. And I said, legalism and holiness are two different things here, guys. And I think you're confusing the issue. 
God still wants to mold you and fashion you into the image of His Son. I still don't believe that alcohol is right for the Christian. I'll stand up here until my dying day and I'll still preach from the pulpit that I don't believe a Christian should partake in alcohol. I don't think that's God's finest for you. I don't believe a Christian should be swearing. I don't think foul language ought to come out of a Christian's mouth. I don't think that's what God wants from us. Read um, Ephesians chapter 4. I don't think that a Christian ought to be gossiping about other people. I don't believe that... You know, you know I said this about our prayer chain. We've, we've said this quite often. The prayer chain is not a gossip chain. We don't call everybody in the church to, say, to, get, to give the latest gossip of what has just happened with somebody else. If somebody calls you on the prayer chain and says, pray for such and such, pray for this situation, they're on their way or whatever... You don't have to have every single detail. God knows all the details. Because my experience is this. When people start asking every detail, it's just because they want to be having something they can pass on to somebody else. They want to be able to just um, get a good story out there to, to get talked about. Facebook is the worst thing I've ever seen when it comes to that. It's just amazing to me the stuff that people put out on Facebook and talk about everything and everybody as believers, I don't think that's God's best for you and I. I don't think lying is for the Christian. I don't think a little white lie is proper, and I don't think a huge lie is proper. I think the Scripture is clear when it says, let your, yay, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. You don't have to add any more to that. You don't got to tell little white lies or anything. I don't believe Christians ought to cheat. I don't think that you ought to try to cheat anybody out of anything. I don't believe that a Christian ought to be greedy. I think a Christian ought to be very humble with whatever God has blessed them with and be willing to share also. But I don't think a Christian ought to be greedy. I don't think a Christian ought to want what everybody else has constantly. And this goes with it. I don't think a Christian ought to be selfish. I think we ought to share. We ought to help others out. When you see a brother in need, and if you turn your face and don't care about that individual, I don't think that's Christ-like. Now, hear me? I'm not saying spread the wealth around. I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying that the government or that an individual ought to be able to tell you what to do with your own wealth. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying this is if, the Lord, if you're in tune with the Lord and you have a heart that is in proper relationship with the Lord, you'll want to help other people. You know, we're not, we're, we don't have a lot. I'll just put it that way. But there's no greater blessing comes from whenever you're able to take what little you got and help somebody else out with it. It is a tremendous blessing. We have done that. We've helped people pay their light bills. We've helped people to get their water turned back on. We've done a lot of things like that. We've bought groceries for people. And it makes you feel wonderful inside that you're able to do that for somebody. It really does. And I don't think a Christian ought to be angry all the time. I think all these are areas in our lives that the Lord wants to come in and He wants to take possession of us and He wants to fashion us and mold us and create us into His image. That's sanctification. That's holiness. God wants us to be holy. And there's a lot more you could add to that list if you wanted to go on. Right? Talked about... Um, politics for a minute. We're all familiar with the um, fact that there's a Supreme Court vacancy on the Supreme Court seat. And there's a thing called, have you ever heard of this, the litmus test? We all heard of the litmus test, right? There's a history behind that. And there's a, such a thing as called litmus paper. And if you take that paper, it's like a bluish gray paper. 
And if you dip it down in a liquid, it will change colors. If you dip it down in, in an acidic liquid, like orange juice or whatever, it turns red. If you, you know, or if lemon juice, orange juice, boric acid, any of that will turn this paper red. If you put it in ammonia or baking soda or something like that, it, it makes it even a darker blue. Well, that's what they mean by a litmus test, okay? And let me say something. The Word of God, or the truth of the Word of God, will test men's hearts. There is a litmus test for you and I, and that's the Word of God. The Word of God comes in, and it performs a litmus test on us. And it says, this heart, this life, has got so much that is wrong with it. It's been tested, and it's been found out that it's lacking so much. And God wants to refashion and remold and re remake that life and reshape that heart in you. Have you opened up the Word of God? Have you read and have you dove into it? And then God begins to reveal things to you about your own walk, about your own life. And it's sort of like a litmus test that says, boy, there's look at all these areas that you could be Improving, improving in. That's what God wants to do. God wants to take your life. He wants to make it more and more like His Son, Jesus Christ. He wants to perform that in you. There's so much more to this walk, to this life, than there is just being saved and going on through life and doing whatever you want to do. And let me say this, let me close with this. There's going to be a great surprise on come on Judgment Day. There are going to be those that are dependent on their good works and they thought that they for sure had a ticket into heaven. They thought for sure that their relationship with God was what it was supposed to be. And they're going to come and they're going to stand before the Lord and He's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. There's going to be those that were so confident in their church attendance and the fact that they were baptized, they're going to be so confident that, they have, that they're going to be in heaven that they're going to come boldly standing before the throne of God and he's going to say, depart from me, I never even knew you. Now there we're talking about non-believers that have never truly given their life to Jesus Christ. But there are those, there are going to be believers that are going to come And they will be saved. But the saddest thing of all, they'll come wobbling in. Now I'm just, bear with me here a minute. Or they're going to come dragging themselves in or limping in and they're going to be so beat up and they're going to be so bruised and they're going to be so just wounded on the inside and on the outside and so bruised as one going through the fire and I want to read 1 Corinthians 3.15 for you. And this is out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible, okay? I like how this was worded. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved. Yet it will be like an escape through fire. What was Paul saying there? He's saying that, yeah, you might be justified, but why do you got to go through life as if you're in a fire, constantly being burned, constantly being tortured, constantly being bruised, constantly being beat up all the time, wouldn't you rather just give your life over to me and let me clean up this mess for you? Wouldn't you rather me give up, or you give up everything to me and let me clean up all this mess for you? Why do you want to endure the fire? Why do you want to stay in the midst of the fire all the time yeah, you'll make it to heaven. You're saved. But why won't you let me clean you up now? That's what this scripture means. You'll make it to heaven, but on the process and on the way there, you're going to, get, you're going to be having to endure so much trial and so much torment and so much fire just because you won't let me take possession of you, won't let me clean up your situations for you in your life. Again, I love this Holman Christian Standard Bible, 1 Corinthians 3.15. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, 
but he will be saved. Yet it will be like an escape through fire. Anybody, are you tired of being in the fire? Are you tired of feeling like your life has just been one total just battle after battle after battle, scar after scar after scar, burn after burn after burn? Why don't you give it over to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why don't you let Him clean up your life for you? Why don't you just let, why don't you just surrender everything to Him this morning? He's standing there. He's waiting there. Don't be like those that look at Jesus on the cross and say, you want me to trust in that? No. Give it all up to Jesus Christ this morning. Allow Him to clean up your life for you. Because what Jesus did, the reason Jesus was hanging up there was because that should have been you. That was supposed to have been you on that cross. That was supposed to have been you and I hanging there with the thorns, hanging there with the blood running down our face, with the crown of thorns on our brow. That was supposed to have been you and I. But Jesus, because He loves us so much, He hung on the cross for you and I. And we didn't have to. All He wants for us to do is through faith, accept what He's done for you and I, Give it all over to Him. Allow Him to take possession of everything you're battling with this morning, everything you're fighting through this morning, and surrender it all to Him this morning. Lord, we just bring to You this morning all of our cares, all of our burdens, all of our problems. We lay them at the foot of Your cross, Lord. And we leave them there, Lord God, knowing that You grant total, complete forgiveness. Lord, Your grace floods over our souls right now, cleansing us from all of our sin. Lord, and we can go the rest of this day, the rest of this week, the rest of this year, the rest of our lives, knowing that we are right with you and that no matter what the enemy attacks us with, no matter what he brings our way, we can bring them to you, we can lay them at your feet, and we can put our faith and our hope and our trust in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you.